Knight and Albatross here again with the Cypher Unlimited crew. We have our usual suspects of AD or Alpha Dean. We have Spigs 18 or Anthony. And Dean, what are we doing here today? We're talking tears. In other words, the tears of your character. So we're going to talk about them, you know, low, mid, and high. Make it do what it do. See what happens in, in how we handle those things. You know, Anthony's going to jump in with a little bit more in detail. And we're just going to break it all down. So, Ant. Catch the ball. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> hey, hey, everybody, welcome back to the CU. You know, today's show is going to be all about character advancement, you know, and the six different tier levels. You know, how does your character advance in tier? What's the difference in power level between tiers? What are some of the most important decisions to consider when tearing up your character? How do you craft adventures according to player tiers? And of course, our thoughts on the player character advancement system as a whole. So first things first, like we always do, we like to define it straight out of the CSR. So Al, can you give us the book definition, please? I can do. So the definition can be found in the Cypher System Revised book, page 20. Um, mm. And it goes as follows. Every character starts the game at first tier. Tier is a measurement of power, toughness, and ability. Characters can advance up to the 6th tier. As your character advances to higher tiers, you gain more abilities, increase your effort, and can improve a stat's edge or increase a stat. Generally speaking, even 1st tier characters are already quite capable. It's safe to assume that they've got some experience under their belt. This is not a zero to hero progression, but rather an instance of competent people refining or honing their capabilities and knowledge. Advancing to higher tiers is not really the goal of uh, Cypher System characters, but rather a representation of how characters progress in a story. Um, pretty elegant, yeah. straightforward definition, but go ahead. I was going to say, before we even go get into how do you advance, you know, in tiers, let's touch on this a little bit because it's very interesting. Like, I, I think there's a, a, a little bit of confusion when people come from other systems to Cypher system. I think there's a big difference between a tier one Cypher system character and a tier one D20 base. Or a level character. one. Yeah, you're way, you're way more capable of an adventurer, of a, a party member, in Cypher system than you are in, say, you know, um, Dungeons and Dragons, Dragons Pathfinder. Pathfinder, you know, any of those other systems. So that's something you should take into account. And I really like the definition here because it really leans into their, like, whole philosophy with the system where it talks about how, like, hey, you're not really thinking about it as your character leveling up. It's more like, hey, this is how your character is progressing through their story. And again, you can see it when you look through any sort of like media or whatever have you, book stories. You can see a character's tier progression, basically. They, they learn better things. They learn to be better at the things they already know, so on and so forth. And yeah, I really like that, um, the way they put forth that definition. Yeah. Well, if, if you think about it, what it is is just like, you know, it's what Cypher, it's the basis of Cypher. You know, Cypher is cinematic in nature. So, you know, we're recreating TV shows or we're recreating, um, you know, movies. Characters in movies and in TV shows are competent. Yes, they will grow along the, you know, along every season of play, you know, or every season that the show is on or, you know, with each movie, you know, they get bigger and better, but they start out as competent, interesting characters. And that's one of the allures for me for Cypher System in general, because it does put you in, uh, it puts you in a position as a GM and as a player that, you know, the character does feel real and fleshed out. You're not worried about, you know, dying from one hit and so on and so forth. Uh, that's a great point, Dean. It is also worth noting that, um, like what you said, if you start off, if your base game start is at a competent level, right? You you don't need 20 levels of character progression. That's one of the whole reasons why it goes to level six. And we'll touch on later, maybe going past six. But one of the reasons why it goes to level six is because essentially that one to four level that you get on D20 base games gets all rolled up into a first level character in Cypher System. So you don't need, you know, you don't need that 20 level of progression because 
you know, when we talk about it a little further, when we jump from like three to four, you'll see that, you know, it, it's sort of like each level in Cypher is sort of like two or three levels in a lot of other systems. Well, but, if, if you, re I'm, I'm not going to cut you off. I'm sorry, yeah. but I'm saying just look at it within, within each tier of Cipher. There's four levels, if you really think about it, because it's a, it's a, it's a four part progression, you know. So it's really kind of like four levels per tier. That's why I always look at a first tier character as a three to five level character, mm -hmm. you know, from any other game that I play. So speaking of which, um. As you tear up, that's a perfect intro. Like, how does the character advance a cipher system for you know people viewing this that doesn't know how the character advancement works? So, Dean, could you read us the definition from the book on character advancement from tier to tier? All right. So th that's a continuation on page from page twenty, and it says to progress to progress to the next tier. Characters earn experience points by pursuing character arcs, going on adventures, and discovering new things. The system is about both discovery and exploration as well as achieving personal goals. So experience points have many uses. And one use is to purchase character benefits. As your character purchases four benefits, they advance to the next tier. Each benefit costs four XP. And you can purchase them in any order, but you must purchase one of each kind of benefit and then advance to the next tier before you can purchase the same benefit again. The four character benefits are as follows. Increasing your capabilities or your pools. You gain four points to add to your stat pools and you can allocate them amongst the pools however you wish. Moving towards perfection. So that means adding one to your might, edge, or speed pool. Might, I'm sorry, might, edge, or intellect pools. Edge, why well, I keep saying pool? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe adding to your strength. effort, you know, increasing your effort score by one and picking up skills. You become trained in one skill of your choice other than attacks or defense. And as described in chapter 11, rules of the game, a character trained in a skill treats difficulty of a related task is one step lower than normal. Um, so, I mean, it, it goes on all about skills. I mean, I can read this whole thing, but I don't think that's necessary. You guys kind of get the idea. And then, of course, there's other options. Player can spend four XP to purchase other special op options in lieu of gaining new skills. Selecting any of these options counts as benefits uh, necessary to the advance to the next tier. The options are as follows. Reduce the cost of wearing armor. Add two to your recovery rolls. Select a new type based ability from a tier, from your tier or a lower tier. Um, so that being said, you have lots of options on how to progress your character. Before we dig any deeper, Galactic House Cat, thank you so much for the sub. We really appreciate it. And we love you as well. We love everyone that watches our content. We're a bunch of idiots that just talk about gaming. So it's awesome that you you're, um, find out our BS and about gaming helpful. We really appreciate it. That kind of derailed us a little bit. But anyways, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of stuff you can do with your advancements, and it's really easy. Um, I think, at least I think compared to other systems, the, the leveling progression here just makes a lot of sense to me. Like, um, you can, again, tackle it from a narrative perspective where you, your character is getting good or better at things that are, you know, pertinent to what's going on in your story or you can have fun with it and really build something kind of wacky like especially with the um other advancement sections where you can take type abilities from other types you can kind of really go ham with your customization here and it's really nice yeah, let's talk about let's I, I think most people who play cypher system understand the four major like um advancements that you normally take right you know the four points to a stat pool is obvious uh, you know everyone does that the extra effort tends to be obvious as well i think that's one of the the two most common or the or the additional edge right the skills and the other options the other options is something i think we should like dive in and talk about because i'm not necessarily sure a lot of people utilize the other options Right, you know, and um, I'll give you a perfect example is the plus two to recovery rolls so is freaking funny. awesome. More people should, especially if you're playing, you know that you're a player in a gritty game or you, you're you 
playing in a campaign where there's a lot of combat and a lot of actions that plus two to recovery rolls is a godsend. Yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, and also, you know, if you look at also selecting a new type based ability from your tier or lower, those those become very uh, useful as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and again, I, you're going to hear me go back to this a lot. But again, to me, with Cypher System, the character progression, the the abilities and everything that you have to choose from and the way it unfolds is, again, just like watching those TV series. You know, when you look at, if you, you know, you go back in time, I don't know, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. If you look at Buffy from season one to season two, she tiered up. You know, by season two, she was at a new tier. She had, you know... She wasn't just, you know, using her natural talents, even though she wasn't a zero level character to start out with, you know, because she came fully loaded. But and and I think that's what we start should start looking at. Look at it from the character story aspect. And that's I, what makes it so cool. Uh I think um the you know, the tier base abilities, that's the perfect way to flesh out your character narratively. And what, what I mean by that is what's happening in the story at that moment makes sense. You know, like if you're, you're, you're playing in a, in a Numenera game and, you know, you're, you're what you call it, you're, you're not the, 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 you know, you're not the nano, right? But you're around multiple nanos, right? You could, just by being associated with these characters, you could justify why you're taking an ability from the na- the nano pool, right? Because it f- makes sense in the narrative. So it fleshes out, it, it takes what's going on active in the story and incorporates it into your character. You know, so those are like the little things you should look at, you know, like when you're building your character, not only what what makes sense mechanically, but what makes sense narratively for your character. Honestly, that's well, not... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Al. No, I'll just say, honestly, that's not... I mentioned it before we start recording. That's honestly one I forget about a ton is taking type abilities from another type. Like, And again, it can be used in so many nice ways. Again, narratively, you can, again, say you're learning something from your group as you're progressing with them. That's an awesome take. And it's like what Infinite Construct said, where um, you can, like, if a player wants just to have a lot of abilities or have a more crunchy character, they yeah. have the option to do so now with this. They can just have a bunch of abilities. Just, they don't, I mean, it's nice to have a narrative reason, but, you know, it's in the rules as written. They can just take abilities from wherever and then they could justify well, it as they see fit. I mean, Infinite Construct said Cypher System is multi-classing on steroids. <laughs> and that's if you're thinking in the sense of classes. See, I don't I, I love the fact that Cypher does not truly look at it in the sense of classes. It really says archetypes. So, you know, if if you really start looking at a lot of different media, a lot of different, you know, uh representations, you know, Batman is a fighter, but he's also a rogue. He's also an investigator. He's also an alchemist. He's also a scientist. You know, so, you know, Batman, you know, or you can turn around and look at a character like, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, I can't remember his name, but the main character from the char- from the, TV, uh, the movie Crow. He was a fighter. He was a magic user. You know, he was a bit of an artificer. You know, these all these little aspects come into play. So when you start thinking of I think of it in the sense that Cypher allows you to make a character. It allows you to make a rich, faceted character that is whatever is what, what your vision is. So at his core, he might be a warrior, or at his core, he might be a magic user. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean essentially, I think where you're going at it. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is your life experiences in game is what shapes your character. There you it know? is. So so. It's, you know, like that's why I think they give you options to to advance during gameplay before you tear up because you might you might say like say you go your first two your first eight XP is like yo um you know my character is learning I'm I'm putting four points in the stat pool because I feel like he's growing as a character he's getting physically hardier you know he's getting smarter 
And then I'm, I'm going to put another four efforts in effort because he's really determined to, to, you know, solve this major problem. But then your next four points, you learn that there's a big war going on and, and you want to wear armor. So you go, hey, I'm going to reduce my, my armor cost. You right. know what I mean? It's like what's happening in the story is what's um, driving you to make your decisions and character development. And it, uh, one or the other, uh, I can't pronounce what your name, Meta Catalepsy, I think it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not defending Cypher in the terms of what it isn't. I, I am literally talking about what it is. You know, it's, it for me, it's like, I'm talking about other systems because I know what I've had to contend with in other games. You know, when you were dealing with, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, I had to take a level of rogue to bring that rogue aspect in, you know, or I, had, you know, to, to bring that stealthy aspect into a character, you know, and then I had to take a level of cleric to bring the fact that I wanted to make the character have some knowledge of healing and so on and so forth. Cypher system, we don't have to do that. You know, like Anthony was saying, you can, you can justify the story aspect of your character in all those multifaceted ideas but it's built right into the system to do that you know so that, that's kind of the, one of the coolest portions i i mean and i'll say it this way because you can even think of it this way you could have a, a a group of all adepts or all explorers and they would all be different you know based on how the person decides to advance it you know and a prime example and then i'm gonna we can move on but a prime example of what we're talking about is like I said, when I created Captain America as a speaker, I created Captain America was a speaker and straight kick ass, you know, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah. All right, um, before we get into the difference of power levels and tier, I think it probably makes more sense because the way this conversation is heading is, you know, what are some of the important decisions you should consider when tearing up your character? Oh, I, I think we, we we hit that pretty well as far as the um, narrative side goes, right? Like, you, you see what's happening in a narrative, you kind of want to adapt to it, um, and you can make your choices that way. Some other important things to consider, or I guess, you know, depends on you personally as a player, is what might help you define your character more. Like, how, like, um, maybe learning skills from, like, some history portion of your background or something um, to help advance your character arc or something like that. Like maybe completing it requires you to have a certain skill or something like that to achieve your whatever your arc is. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of different things. Some people just want to make fun characters, so they just might choose things to build just for fun. There's really no wrong way to do it. And I just love how, like... Um, what you call it the importance of what 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 well, excuse me just to go back to the original question what's really important when it comes to character creations what you find important there's no set important thing if that makes sense it's really what you as the player want to see your character grow and do yeah i mean i, I can't agree more you know with that i mean i i, I think that's probably one of the best statements we've ever made about what Cypher is, because that's just awesome, you know. It is what your vision is. It is what you feel in your 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 soul, your psyche as your character develops, you know. And when we start talking about higher tiers, I'm going to kind of address that too. But Ant, you had something to say on this one? Yeah, I, I think I kind of view it a slightly different, even though I totally agree with what your guys are saying. You know, ultimately, it, it is what you want, but I... I'm gonna probably take it a little step further. Like when when you're at the stage when you're tearing up or advancing from one character to another, I think there's probably like two things that you you should focus on, right? As a player to be helpful to the the whole group and the story, right? The the first one is how am I benefiting the group as a whole? What am I providing to the group, right? So that might be the mechanical portion like what what abilities you know what advancements am i taking that's gonna make it make the you know what does the group need and how can i provide that mechanically so that's one thing you should consider when you're tearing up your character is okay 
this might it can't always be what you want because what you want might not necessarily be what's best for the group right you know so I, I'm, I'll, I'll say that right <laughs> so you, you you have to view the, the first point is you have to view okay are some of these uh, um, like level ups I'm taking is it gonna help the overall party right the second part of this like when what i personally think about is how is the story dictating how my character is growing right so now that i've i thought about what how can i help the group as a whole now i think of how has the story impacted my character and what this de what decisions do i make in advancement that directly affect the narrative right which was something like what we were talking about earlier right so now I, I'm gonna say, okay, you know, now we're playing a gritty supers game, and I, I, you know, I noticed that, you know, the the I, I witnessed someone die, right? So now I'm gonna take a skill that that um uh, help me prevent something like that. I, I'm just like speaking off the top of my head, but you know, like the narrative should dictate also as well as how you advance your character. It's not always what 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 you call it um. You know, it's not always what's best for you or most fun for you, but what fits into the narrative and what's best for the group. That's definitely a good take. Um, I mean, what, what did I'm just saying? I mean, I, I see where you're going with that, Anthony, but I don't think that's as important unless you are, you know, moving into a much higher tier game. And if the game has kind of a meta focus you know i mean because you can you can actually have you can have quite a lot of fun too with disparaging ideals if it's adding to the story so i think it's like both i think i think you i think you're 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 like you got something and i then i can say yeah it, it can go the other way too so i think it works both ways yeah, yeah, I'm not saying, I, I'm just saying how I personally view when I'm, I'm tearing up. And I'm not talking about leveling up from first. I'm talking about camp, if we're in a campaign, right? Like, you know, like, in a campaign, you got to use the narrative as, as the basis for how your character grows. Because it's like any good book or any good, you know, TV show or trilogy of movies, you see the growth of the character and the, the character's abilities go according to the experiences they had in previous episodes, previous books, right. previous movies. So exactly. that, that's a given, right? But what, what I also mean is that w when I was talking about like what's best for the group, right? If, if you're playing in a game, right, where you picked um, Drives Like a Maniac, right? And then you decide that you want to be the funny, the, the funny um, do nothing guy. How did the group took your focus as drives like a maniac because they wanted somebody that could drive like a maniac. And then you don't take anything that follows behind that. It may be fun for you, but in the long run, it might not be fun for the rest of the party. Well, no, 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 and... no, no, and I agree with you there. I'm not yeah. saying it in that sense. I'm saying that... That was the only point I was trying to make, though. Yeah, no, no like I said, I agree with you there. I, I think maybe we, like we said, we're saying the same thing. I'm just saying that I think some things don't necessarily have to necessarily benefit the party i mean think about it this way one of one of our i don't know everybody watched but a lot of people watched uh yeah but that's why i said multiple you you have four advancements right that's why I said, you know like i'm not saying all four of your advancements has to benefit the party but at least one you should take that into consideration oh no there and I, that's what i'm saying I, I was like i said like if you think about the tv show um firefly mm. the character of jane you know was an ass he had a lot of abilities that benefited the group but he was a bit of a jerk you know so it's, it's some of his abilities did not because he was kind of selfish self-centered stuff like that so yeah but he benefited that. the group you know it's like murdoch from the a team you yeah. Know what I mean? yeah he could fly anything but he was yeah. crazy as <laughs> so yeah we, we're on the same sheet of music <laughs> so yeah but, but, but it, it would be like having murdoch from the a team but not taking any abilities that helps him in his flying of anything. And I agree with you. I, I would never, you know, suggest that. Yeah, you got to balance it out. So. You definitely need to stay, like, um, 
what you call it, within the realm of the initial idea you put forth. Um, I wasn't saying what I was saying earlier, like you can just do whatever you'd like. Of course, you want to try to stay in character, essentially. Like, you don't want to say, hey, I'm the drives like a maniac, but I actually don't like driving. So I'm going to take all these other abilities and stuff. Yeah, that's kind of a jerk move. <laughs> you don't want right. to do that. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I mean, we should move on to the next point. Yeah, I was just bringing it up because that's what, you know, what the question was. Is, Makes you sense. Know, what, what should you consider when you're tearing up your character? Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. I, I, think it, yeah. I think it's a... I think it's it's a a full on gamut. That's what what's going to advance the story. What's going to keep the story fun? What's going to benefit the group as a whole? Because of course, you know, RPGs are an interactive storytelling you know event. So the characters should all be a part of the the, the fun there. You know. Um. It, it just, in chat, they're talking about Cypher and Super... Cypher's, Cypher system handles superheroes awesome. Really? Yeah, I, 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 like, I, I think it's one of the... One of the genres that it handles the best, to yeah. be honest. Oh. I mean, maybe we'll, we did a video on it, but when Claim the Sky comes out, we'll, we'll do another one. Oh, because yeah. I, I think that's one of the genres that... It, it handles every tier of superheroes very well. And since we're talking about tiers, we could actually break it down in superhero terms to make it, um, you know, um, make it simplified so you can understand. So what's the difference in power tiers, guys? Well, what's the difference in power levels and tiers? If you look at it this way, the way I, I look at it the same way it's set up in the book. Then um, break, before you go on a rant, break it down from tier one, two first. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm looking the same way it's in the book. In the same way it's in the book. Low, medium, and high. Mm -hmm. Low tier is one and two. Medium is three or four. High is five and six. Um, I think the difference between the tiers like that, you know, low, like medium, first, high. Let, before we get to the difference, first let's discuss what tier one and two consists of like well that's what i'm saying i'm, I'm yeah. saying that tier one and two i look at that as your your baseline that's you know you're starting out with your abilities you know you're establishing your character you're establishing your place in the world um that's how i see tier one and two that's how i see the, the lower tiers it's getting your feet wet learning the the aspects of what you're capable of and basically setting the ground for where you're going to go. That that that's me. I mean, what well, one to two is a power level I've I've worked with the most. Um and it's like what we described earlier. They're like very competent um adventurers. Like they have a wide variety of abilities already available to them. Um it doesn't feel like, you know, one strong baddie will just wipe the whole party. You know, they're very formidable. Um and again, it, it, it's pretty nice to jump into a game when you're like tier one, but you can still actually do stuff. Like, I, again, that, that's something I enjoyed heavily uh, when I first played Cypher System. I looked at my level one character sheet and I was like, or excuse me, my tier one character sheet. And I was like, whoa, I can do all of this right now? Like, and uh, it's it's pretty nice seeing that, that um, competency between the first and second tiers uh, compared to other games like D&D &D and whatever have you. Um, yeah. All right. Um, I, I view tier one, and like if we we went into genres, tier one is the the capable character. You know, if if we were dealing in in um, superheroes, the tier one is the street level hero. Tier one and two is the street level. You know, um, he's your daredevil. He's your your um, Captain America. You know, he, he's your Power Man and Iron Fist. If, we, if we're dealing in fantasy, he's your local guild adventurer, you know, who, who may handle, you know, uh, fight the occasional troll within its village and maybe outside of a small city, right? Tier three and four is people dealing in, in fantasy, is people dealing with empire conflicts. You know, it's the, it's the, the sergeant of the militia. It's the... You know, it's the man at arms. It's superheroes. It, it would be the spider, not not Spider Man. It would be the Batman, the the um, you know, like the 
they deal with stuff within the city. You know, so the, the Batmans, the Flashes. Now, if we're doing five or six, it's that's your Paragon heroes. That's your heavy magic user in the family center, your Elemeister, your your Dritz Durdern, that's your Superman, your, your you know, um, Captain Marvel, your Silver Surfer. Like, now they dealing with world conflicts. They dealing with intergalactic issues. You know, so it, it, it boils down into the way you craft your adventures and the way your characters are. Yeah, Spider-Man is a, a city level hero. Even though his power level might be a three, four, his story arc is definitely a one, two. I, I look at it this way. I yeah. look at it this way. I don't look, when you want to talk about one, two or, or, or street level heroes, you know, cause even Luke Cage, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, they're street level, city level, you know, heroes per se, but they can actually move up into that three, four category. They yeah, but, are, but, 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 that's, they, that's, but that's their stories, but their stories are not. But um, Dean, that's why we role play. You start off with the Luke Cage character, and then you wind up with the Luke Cage in the Defenders by the time you level five or six. Oh, I understand that. That's what I'm saying. I agree with you. I'm not yeah. saying, I'm not saying it was. I'm just, you know, saying as far as when you start, you know, looking at the the, the strength, power levels, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, I, I agree with you. You know that when you get to five, six, you know, we're talking planet movers, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, intergalactic fights and so on and so forth. We're talking about the Avengers by the time they made it to Endgame. Yeah, but, you know, even if we look at out in fantasy, it's your Elmeisters, it's your yeah, Elminster and, and, yeah. and like you said, Elminster, Dritz, you, you know, uh, Lord in, of Canaan. In, in, in sci-fi, it's what you call it. It's, it's your, Luke Skywalker at the end Empire, of... It's Luke Skywalker and Return of the Jedi. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. You know. You know, it's it's your Captain Kirk in, in Star Trek, you know, in the, you know, later in the series. It's Captain Kirk after he became an admiral and busted back to a captain. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's what that is, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's those, it's those elements. And it literally, the difference... The difference is, I think the difference in tiers and power levels is truly the story you want to tell versus the character itself. It's the story that the GM wants to tell. How epic is this story? How how hard is it going to, you know, where is it pushing the envelope at? And I and, think... Oh, go ahead, Dean, I'm sorry. I'm just saying that, I was just finishing up with, I think that's the the difference between the 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 stories you know between the the tears is the story that you can tell so also i think it's worth noting that we, we touch on mechanically because the there's a huge jump from tier two to three four in the type of abilities you get right oh, yeah, absolutely it, it's also worth mentioning that you know with the uh, and, you know, every time you're tearing up, you're picking up extra edge, right? So a lot of those abilities you had early in the game become free, basically. You know, so it's worth mentioning that, you know, it might have cost you some points from your pool at tier one and two, you know, to do that special ability you had that you didn't necessarily spam because you didn't want to, you know, deplete your pools. By the time you're level five, that's a free ability for you now. So, right. you know... It actually changes the way you play your character. It makes your character, you know, I, I, I think that's one of the things I like about system, you know, resource management systems is that it's the growth of your character narratively is so visible in gameplay, you know, that you don't necessarily get from, you know, static mechanical systems because you spent, like, say you had, a, what, what's, what's the ability in Thrall that costs two points and you don't have one, it costs you one point to use, right? Mm -hmm. By the time you're tier three, Thrall is, three, is free. You know what I mean? So you remember in the earlier sessions, I had a, you know, should I waste this one point? I'm down to four points. You know, you had those decisions. And as you get higher in level, you start to realize, hey, you know, my cat, I see the growth. My character doesn't have to, I don't have to make that tough decision anymore. I could just use the ability and it, it's not costing me anything. Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. Like um, one ability that I really dig, like I made a character for a sci-fi game 
and it was a level he finally made level three and he had the deadly aim ability that cost three points to use you know cost three three speed points but by then i had a th edge of three because he was an explorer it was great you know so that was something i could start spamming but oh what every every time i shot somebody deadly aim boom <laughs> extra two points of damage without and, and you know you could explain it as a character like say you know, i've been f you know shooting for the last eight sessions, all I've been doing was firing and aiming. I've gotten better. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. And that's what I'm saying. It becomes it becomes story element, you know, which, again, makes those those points and th those th they become points of pleasure almost, you know, because it's like you can visibly see your character getting better and it's not at some great cost, per se. And one thing I will say, though, is that, again, on the flip side, again, we're talking about narrative, how you can see it, you know, it connects to the narrative, you know, it just makes sense to see how the characters grow within the story. But on the opposite side, as like a player who like you enjoy some level of crunch when it comes to your characters, right? It's it's really nice to have that level of like what you call it, um control and to be able to add abilities to your character and whatnot and again when you're level one two you, those abilities cost points right when you're three four they don't cost any points of like depending on what the ability is right so as a player it's like wow now i can y use these abilities willy-nilly like and again it's nice to see the narrative to explain like hey my body got hardy or whatever have you but as a player it's like i get to use the fun little treats now even more like it's it's and it's really nice <laughs> And it's an, another aspect, too, with that is also, like, if you are smart about it, let's just say you have a, let's say you have a, a, a skill like you're, you're trained in, I don't know, say stealth, you're, you're trained in stealth, but now at the next level, you decide, you know what, I'm going to bump it up, I'm going to be specialized. So now you got basically two free levels of effort anytime you're stealthy. You become, <laughs> boom, I'm invisible. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that type of cool aspect that you know the, you bring to the, the table. But the resource decisions are still there though, right? Right, because absolutely. You, because you picked up that new cool ability that happens to cost five points from your speed pool, which you don't have. So now you still have, do I use this really cool super ability or do I use this ability that's free? Might not be as powerful or impactful to the scene, but it's not costing me anything. So but you again, still have those decisions, you know, so you never lose the resource decision aspect. It just changes. Right. But even, even with that, like you said, it's five points, but how much edge do I have in that particular ability? You know, yeah, I, so, I'm just like, speaking no, no, I'm, not, I'm saying, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying you throw it out there and you look at it because it becomes again, that resource ideology, what you're talking about, you know, do I have, do I have edge in this ability? Do I have edge in that ability? So the five points that I might spend, oh, wait a minute, I got three, I got three, you know, edge here. Now it's only two. Also, you know? another, another thing you could take into consideration as you're going up in tier is that you could start taking abilities that you don't have edge in, but are super powerful, yep. right? So you could say, hey, this, you know, I don't have any edge in intellect, but I really like this ability, right? Now, do I save this as, you know, my, oh, shit, hit, shit's about to hit the fan, and this is my <laughs> life, you know, this is the, you know, my, the one, of, like, my one tier six spell that I use a day, because I, it's going to cost me six points on my intellect pool, and I have zero edge in that. Exactly. You know what I mean? So you could give yourselves those decisions as well, and it also, like, flavors out your character. Right, exactly. I, I'm so with it, you know. <laughs> um yeah I think so we said pretty much a lot about uh the differences between the power levels here what was the next thing we got here oh i mean i just essentially so we, we we like like you know put a bow on this essentially what i don't know what i'm trying to say is that when, when you're tearing up you know like from one to two three to four five to six you know as a player once again take the narrative into account take how useful your character is and also take into account where do you have, like what Dean said, where do you have your effort and edge? And when, when you're making those decisions, the abilities you choose 
depend a lot of it will depend on the choices you made during in between sessions as you were tearing up you know it's not like D&D where you you get all everything at once so the decision you made with your first 4 XP might directly affect your last 4 XP before you tear up so you know just take that into account exactly Let's talk about GMing the different tiers because I think this is um like like um I, I I think this is what you call it a topic that um maybe not all of us have experience in but it's definitely something worth talking and mentioning and if anyone in chat has um any questions or anyone has a lot of experience at tier six let us know as well because I don't think um. You know, I don't think any of us are experts on tiers five and six. I mean, I can't speak for Dean. I know me and Al are. So, well, you know, we open only, to the questions. Yeah, definitely throw out your question. <laughs> tier, tier five and six, I've run a few things. Let's there. start from tier one and two first, though, because it's just so. Okay, well, <laughs> tier one, two, well, talking about tier one and two, that's the sweet spot. And I believe we probably. The three of us have run between us probably 500 adventures or more at tier one because we do so many one shots at such a low level. Yes, you know, at at the bottom tier, and that's where what comes into play. I mean, you know, I think we should all probably start, you know, maybe trying to do some mini campaigns or something where we move up. But you know. Uh, one and two is a sweet spot. It it makes for a fun game, no matter what genre you're playing in. And I think it's, you know. But well, what's your mindset as a is. GM? Like what you say? What's your mindset as a GM in one or two? You know, like I, like I want to, like let let's let's try to get into like the adventure crafting idea of I'm I'm crafting a game for a tier one or two. I know characters are either tier one or two. So well, well, how do you develop your challenges? Instead of like defining what tier one we already defined what tier one or two is. Like what's from a GM standpoint, what like what are you looking at? Well it, it's it's for me it's 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 a diverging role. If I'm running a one shot you know, one to one to you know, say five or six shots in an adventure of mini arc or something like that. Um, that's different than if I'm going to run a campaign. You know, my mindset to running those one shots, those those short arcs, is entertainment. Um, how how easy is it going to be for me to introduce everything to the people, and basically resolution. You know, that that's what that does for me. So, I mean, I view it as like, you know, like what Infinite Construct said, you know, it's the beginning of the hero's journey. So you structuring your adventures as a GM for tiers one or two, like what you would see in most MCG adventures. You know, you might have uh, one or two combat scenes, you know, maybe one environmental scene, a couple of narrative scenes. The, the 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 monsters and bad guys are straight out the book, you know that there's not much adjustment involved because, you know the the the, the characters could deal with that sort of threat, right? It's not necessary. I'm not saying you can't change characters, but I'm just saying that you could take a base villain from any of the MCG books, and it'll probably work just fine with some slight tweaking, depending you know how your characters play. But there isn't much, I don't want to say GMing, but there isn't much like tinkering with the nat, with, with your scene su- structure as you would in higher tiers. I agree with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely agree. Um, this is the area I honestly have basically all my experience in. I don't think I've ever done a game that's three tier three or higher. Um, maybe once I've played in a game where it was like, hey, let's do it for fun. I don't, I don't even think we've ever done a game where we were like tier four or something. Like, um, but tier one and two is very nice as, a, especially as a new GM, because uh, you don't have as much to worry about. Like their their stats aren't too high. They only have a handful of abilities. 
but as a player it feels nice because you still have a wide variety of things to do as opposed to a level one or two character from another system but as the gm there's again it's it's really i guess comforting to know that again they have enough options to keep them happy but not too many options to overwhelm you and again it, it takes some time to get used to like what characters can really like output with their abilities versus their edge etc all the effort all that stuff but after a few games or whatnot uh, i'm again i'm talking from the perspective of like a brand new gm because uh, that's basically i'm the newest one here so that's my biggest perspective is the new gm perspective um what you call it it becomes much easier as time goes on to see how they're dealing with the challenges you're throwing at them and because of the low level the tier one tier two there really isn't too much tinkering between the sessions or even between the different encounters of the same session to get things back on track um it's when you again uh, this is an assumption when you get to higher tiers where they have access to more things where things get a little more tricky but i can't really speak on that because i have not done it <laughs> well, i mean that's, that's a great point let's go to tier three and four right okay. you know, I, from my standpoint right i i i have a pretty good experience with tier three and four Tier five and six is where it's gonna get a little wonky for me. But for three and four, I found that not now I'm adjusting, you know, I'm adjusting scenes more on the fly, right? Because the characters are starting to one, they're starting to get higher pools, you know? So the, the one monster might not necessarily be enough of a threat, even if it's a level, you know, six or seven monster, right? the threat level isn't going to be there. It's more adding environmental, you know, environmental obstacles into the scenes. It's taking abilities from other monsters and fusing it, you know, fusing two monsters together to give your creature the little extra oomph to be a threat, right? The, the stories narratively now have to have a bigger scope because the characters have more abilities to handle, you know, like, they'll treat low level fight scenes as what they are mooks you know like they're gonna just like you know blitz like uh, rampage through your level two creatures so you have to be more creative in your scene structure is scene structure as a gm when you, you when you start hitting levels three and four and oh you brought up a good point now they start having game changing abilities by level four so you have to take that in account as well. And before, you might have been able to justify not reading the player's character sheets for your level one and two adventure. But now if you're running an adventure for level three and four, you got to start knowing exactly what's on your player's character sheets because they might have an ability that just throws your whole game out of whack. <laughs> right. And that's what I'm saying. For me, you know, three and four... Uh, I actually enjoy three and four. I think I enjoy three and four more than I enjoy five and six. I enjoy three and four because it kind of, it's kind of a, it becomes a chess game between you and the players. You know, how creative can you be in what they face? You know, the fact that Cypher system, your, your antagonist, your NPC don't have to be built like you build the player characters gives you a lot of leeway and a lot of advantage and how you're going to approach them. So, you know, you know, average uh, tier six and seven character, that's, you know, average character has 18 hit points to 21 hit points. That's average, unless you're doing some adjustments with those aspects. So that's when you got to start being smart. Does this character, does that NPC have armor? Does that P NPC, you know, is, is he immune to a specific type of attack? Uh, does he have, uh, an ability to to actually negate damage somehow. All these little chess moves that you can play because you know your player characters. I mean, when you think about it, you know, if you got a character that can dole out six points of damage, he's by three, four, he's got two or three levels of effort. He can dump three levels of effort, adding nine points. So that's 15 points. So your, eight, your level six, 18 hit point monster is done basically in a single attack. So that's why you have to start becoming, start playing chess. Like yeah. Anthony said, knowing what your players can do. And, and I'll go even a step further. That's when you start bringing into consideration, uh, 
when I was talking to Jim, me and Jim Sprinkles were talking about this like a week ago, right? The, the concept of when you hit in higher tiers, and I'm going to say this so everyone fully understands me, it does not make sense that your villain has ciphers and is not using them on the players. Right. Or your villain has an artifact, a powerful artifact, and is not using them against the players. So if you, once you start hitting tier three, four, you, if you're, you know, if they don't beat these villains at a certain time, they dumping all their ciphers on the players. They, right. They're yeah. using their artifacts on the players. You know, you, you can't allow your players to just steamroll because, you know, they're going to have the abilities and the stat pool numbers to absorb regular combat hits. You right. you have to be creative. Like I said, it, it becomes a chess game. You know, uh, Meta Catalepsy basically was talking about, you know, using the environment. Yes, mm -hmm. use the environment. Um, you can put, you can do things that do ambient damage. Mm -hmm. You can, you can area effects, you know, um, I actually, in one game, I actually had a monster that every time you hit it, it had a reactionary strike. So it did a, you know, it did a, bl a, a burst of uh, heat every time you hit it and everybody would take a point of damage, you know, stuff like that. You know, you can have so many different ways to play your character and have fun with it. They're still not undefeatable. They're, they're, it's not like Dungeons and Dragons, again, even going up in tiers. That's another thing I like. Combat still doesn't have to take two hours in Cypher System. You can have a meaningful combat or, or a meaningful encounter that takes 20, 25 minutes to get through, and the player characters are walking away from it like, whoa, what happened here? <laughs> you know, you know, and, and, and that's, I think that's one of the other things I really dig about, you know, tier three, four. So I think here's the, the one tier as a GM that I've maybe run two sessions of tier six. So I don't have like the super experience, but I can tell you what I did have from running tier six. Like as a GM, the first time I ran it, I was unprepared. <laughs> I should not, not, you know what I mean? Like I was able to adjust mid session, but everything I put out, even the, like the, you know, like the scenes that I, I thought were going to be some dialogue, some, you know, like puzzle solving was bypassed by some random ability some character had <laughs> or some, some, you know, specialized skill like Dean had with a, a level of effort that made it like totally, you know, useless. Like I, I start to think, you have to start thinking in a grander scale with tier five and six. Not only do you have to, you're seeing not only, especially combat scenes, not only do they have to directly affect your players, they have to directly affect everyone around them. Like, not only do you have to threaten them, you got to threaten civilians, you know, threaten city blocks, you know what I mean? In, in order to get the grand scale of scene that you want from a level six character. You know, it's fine at level five or six to have them beat up a couple of people in the beginning scenes, but you need you need to be ramping up. And I think that was my early mistake the first time I ran level six that I, you know, I didn't realize all the abilities they had. Thank God for the thank God for me. You know, like I said, I haven't run as many high tier adventures as I want, but thank God it was a progression. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of prepared from being at three and four, going to five and six and playing for a while and realizing how creative players can get and how, you know, the number crunching can be. So five and six for me becomes like we were saying earlier, that's when I'm going to do my infinity gauntlet, you know, storyline. That's when I'm going to do, uh, you know, the, what is it? Uh, the, the, the two towers for Lord of the Rings. If we're talking about, you know, you know, fantasy, you know, that th those are going to be those those great grand moments where I'm going to be throwing. First of all, I'm going to be throwing probably a lot of things, very things. I'm going to tax. You know, I've learned that you tax the characters in all aspects, socially, physically, mentally, combatively. You know, and again, it's those. It's when you get to the point that you want to tell that grand 
magnificent, you know, visual story. You know, it's, like I said, it's, it's watching Endgame. You know, Captain America gets to pick up the hammer. <laughs> you know, I mean, these are those, those are the things that you want in your, your game. Meta also brought up a great point is your GM intrusions have to change by tier five. Absolutely. You know, like your 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 intrusions what this may sound like an asshole move, but your intrusions, one, they may have to slow down a little in higher tier games, like not so many, but when, the ones that you do do have to be impactful. They have to be not only impactful to the player, but have to be impactful to the entire narrative. You know what I mean? Because you can't you can't have that he, you drop your weapon or you can't do anything for a turn. You know, those intrusions are not going to work. You know, you got to be like, hey, you know, you fighting this bad guy and this building's collapsing with thousands of people behind you. Now you have to make a decision. Your aunt Sue's in that building. You know, <laughs> what are you going to do? You know what I mean? You, you, you have to make them impactful to the story. Exactly. Mm. Um, sorry, I'm not chiming in much. Um, because again, this isn't my forte or my arena. Um, but if I were to ever do, like, uh, you know, because it would most likely be a one shot. You know, I have never successfully done like a long overarching game where the you know characters build their way up to tier six. So most likely at this point, I'd just be running a one shot of tier six characters. Um, but what I would do in that situation is definitely, like, I think it was, um, what Infinite Construct have. Maybe not a spreadsheet, but I would definitely have notable abilities for each of the characters somewhere visible at all times. Like, hey, they're like, you know like how Anthony was saying, they're like, at tier four, they get these, like, crazy abilities that can completely shift how certain things go. All yeah. those abilities, you need to know what they are. For sure, to, to be able to run that session um, with some, I guess, consistency. So, like, if they're not, like, you want to put consistent uh, challenges in front of them, not, like, adjusting on the fly like Anthony had to because he was unprepared. If he had known they had su such and such abilities, he could have, like, you know, situated each challenge consistently. Again, uh, oh, what? No, you were going to chime in? No, 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 okay. I, I'll chime in when you're done. No, you it, it, just said something that made me think of something. It, it was just, it's, again, I haven't done it myself, but just as my mindset going into it would be, again, it's it's hard to prepare what a player might do with their abilities, but to know what they are is just so important. <clears throat> and again, like Anthony was saying, these, and I guess what everyone, Anthony, uh, excuse me, the chat was saying, the GM intrusions have to be super duper, like, like, like Anthony said, they have to enforce the player to make a decision, not something that they're going to be able to topple easily, like with these earlier intrusions. And that's something me as a GM might struggle with because I've never had to make those GM intrusions before. I've always had the level, you know, tier one or two GM intrusions. So I would definitely try to have like, maybe uh maybe make up my own like list of gm intrusions like a pick and choose from later on like you know during the game or again i'm not sure if the gm intrusion deck has intrusions of that magnitude in it but i would definitely search through the deck and have those particular ones on hand to be ready for that high tier game yeah i mean and gm intrusions are Gym intrusions are. are, are I waited patiently for Al to finish it. <laughs> oh well, go ahead, go ahead, man. Okay, <laughs> good. You, you started your, your thought. No, it's you know, fine. I, I got it. I got it right here. Go ahead. Big go ahead. You you, you go ahead. The, the, two, the two points I was gonna make real quick that Al said that um made me think about it. Those special abilities that those characters have at tier six. Who's to say your NPCs can have those same abilities? So take that into account, regardless of what the NPC has on their stat sheet, if you're using one that's pre-written, add some of those extra abilities onto those characters, because one, is going to make them more interesting, and two, is going to give the players decisions to, to um, have, you know, to go against some of the same abilities that they might be capable of. And the, the second thing I'm going to say is, I noticed in chat people were saying, one shot tier six, my birthday's on the 18th, which is next Thursday. I would love to run a tier six game. So if anybody wants to hit me up on Discord today, you pick the genre, we'll get four people, and we'll sit, craft some tier six 
characters together. And next Thursday, I have no problems running a tier six game, and we'll we'll fuck up whatever it is, whatever <laughs> genre it is, and we'll stumble through it together. So if anybody's interested in doing that, just hit me up on the Cypher Limited Discord. And next Thursday, I promise you, we can play a really cool tier six game. I'm in. I should mm. be free if work doesn't mess up my schedule again, but yeah. <laughs> I'm in. Definitely. So, what I was going to say, though, because I was looking in the chat, too, and that's where I was kind of going with it. People were talking about GMIs versus PIs versus uh, player intrusion. And I kind of kind of like the way it's set up in the book. Um, player intrusion should be kind of focused. They can be big, but they need to be focused. They should be focused along the lines of your type. You know, that was a, a, a little piece of... Um, I guess you say guidance that Monty Cook did because when we first started using player intrusions, there were no rules for it. And we went totally and utterly ape shit. And it cost you two points to do two XP to do an intrusion. So I think especially getting the higher tiers that it should be a little bit focused based on your type, you know, it should be something along those lines, your intrusions. Um, GM intrusions, like Anthony said, they, they, they have to be impactful. I think one of the most impactful GM intrusions I did was we had a character, just to give you an idea of how it worked. We had a character and he's fighting against the bad guy. So they were getting the better of him. And I said, okay, I'm gonna offer a group intrusion. And what the bad guy did was he literally activated a device. He had, he had a, a, a mental cipher. He activated it in that moment. And what it did was it caused all the characters to flash back on very stressful or emotional points in their life and they had to overcome this particular crazy attack and it really you know set the stage so stuff like that just to give you an idea of if you want to make it you know super impactful on how you want to you know hit your players off and so on and so forth um yeah you know i agree with these guys though yeah let's do a tier six game yeah i i think it'll be a lot of fun Sounds like Eric's already getting excited and uh, yeah. Ken. <laughs> yeah, we could definitely get some tier six shenanigans going. You know, I I, I want more experience as a player and as a GM, of course. You know, I I think that um I, you know I I haven't been lucky enough to have a long standing campaign that runs all the way to tier six, but we could cheat the system and just do a tier six game. Well, <laughs> Anthony, yeah. I, I, and I'll make another suggestion. I'm gonna throw it out there. Because I've been saying this since, you know, everything was announced for Tallest and all of that. And I've been working on getting my world together for my fantasy adventure. I want to run a full term game. And I think maybe, you know, trying to set something up and run in twice a week. I mean, twice a month on the server, get a nice group together. Anthony L, I'm going to put the challenge out to you too. You guys set up something, you know, twice a month. You know, we may not be able to play in each other's games. But if we all run a full campaign and see how far we can go with it. I'm so, just here like hey, co I'm just saying, one guys. shot. You know, I'm just saying, guys, I mean, we always do one shot. I mean, I mean, Eric, and, and Eric, I'm, Eric I'm going has to... a lot of experience with living campaigns. So I'm pretty sure we could do a toilet living campaign with Eric's help because yeah. I think that's one of his specialties to begin with. Well, He's I mean, see, that would even campaign. that could be something even greater if we came up with a living campaign. Then we probably all could play together. Yeah. Because that one week where somebody's running, we can just like script some stuff out, and then we can all take over. You know, Anthony, you take a month. I take a month. Al, you take a month. Then we get to circle back around. Yep. So just throwing it out there, guys. Just throwing it out there. Um, a um living campaign slash what you call it? What's the other term for it? West marches would be definitely super very like pretty fun. Um, especially again to get that experience of you know actually advancing tiers instead of just hey we're playing a tier three game hey, we're playing a tier three game like Ken I'm not teasing you I'm the, I, I'm serious I'm 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 ready oh um, look I got a I got a whole well, crazy you totally spirit us all. Yes. we're getting super sidetracked so let's go back and get back in so do yeah. some genres handle different tiers better Anthony what do you say. Oh, I didn't even hear what the question was. What you said? Do some tiers, do some genres handle tiers better? Absolutely. I, I think that, um, I think Numenera, if we use Numenera as the base, 
I think Numenera handles all the tears um, pretty well. You know, I, 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 I would like to see tier six Numenera in action. I've never had experience with it, but I assume that if it's like, you know, Numenera is like that sci-fi fantasy mix. So, you know, there's room for growth and all that. But there's some genres that just may not actually, like modern games, tier six might not be the best, like, um, you know, best area for if you're doing a strictly modern game. I think tier six, even though, like, if you're taking the speaker characters, you start getting into those fantastical abilities. And if you start, as a GM, start eliminating them to make sense for your story, then why are you kind of, like, why are you kind of playing that in the first place? But then the, then you have genres like supers that handles tiers. Supers really shines at tiers three to six. That's when you start really getting into, you know, like a lot of people complain when they when 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 they're like, hey, hey you want to play supers and and you start crafting tier one and everybody wants to be Superman or Silver Surfer. That's not a tier one character. That's no. a tier four or five character, right? You know, or, or tier six character. Once you get to tier four, five, and six, you could create the whole Marvel universe, the whole DC universe, the whole Dark Horse universe. You, you're capable of creating all that. So supers handles um, high level, um, fantasy handles high level, some sci-fi, and I'll say the stuff that don't handle it will probably be hard. You really don't want to go too high tier in horror. You might not want to go too high tier in modern. You might want want to go too high tier and historical, like those are the those those are the sort of genres that you might want to stick to the one through four, if that makes any sense. I even go so far as say one through three, with those lower ones, only because, like you said, the fantastical abilities. And when you start hitting tier four, some of the the bleed over is 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 is, is there, um, but you can kind of explain things away, with the uh, you know. With the with the, with the tier threes, um, I I think absolutely, you know that different different genres, you know it, it was funny because um and I even experimented with it oh, with, the, a, with a couple strange, of friends. The strains definitely handles all the tiers as well too. Oh yeah, yeah. But I was just saying um I experimented with the tiers with the modern game because somebody wanted to play like a Fast and Furious game. And it was crazy because you could really get stupid by tier four. That was kind of it. When you hit, like you said, tier five, fast, and even with the stupid ridiculousness that they do, you know, <laughs> jumping off mountains with grappling guns and swinging the car around and all that, all was handled much better at tier four than it would be at, you know, uh, tier five and six. Um, and again, y'all know I don't have much experience with the higher tiers. I just know that you can pretty much handle everything with one and two and it still feels nice. <laughs> yeah. But I will say, I will say some, some genres aren't as enjoyable in the lower levels than they would be in the higher levels. And, and That's definitely true. Like we, pre we preach the, the, you know, the, the supers, but supers is definitely better at tier three and forward than it is in tier one and two. Now I'm not saying you can't have good super games in tier one and two, but I think once you start hitting that tier three, you really, really start getting into the nitty gritty of you know the superhero. Well, you game. you become you become a force to be reckoned with. Mm -hmm. A tier one and two, you know, that's like the TV show Heroes. That's like the, the those 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 shows. What was it, Mutant X, where you worried about the regular guy with a gun, you know, because you know, or they had some you know stupid device to negate your power or something. But you know, when you like you said tier three, you're starting talking about okay. I'm getting into my 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 low level magneto badassery, you know. Or what you got an electronic device? I'm gonna you know pulse it. It's done. This is the kind of stuff that we 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 like. But there are also certain genres that are extremely fun at low tier. Like yeah. if you want to play like a gritty, you know, gritty crime drama, you know, you want to you want to recreate Mad Max or something like that. That's some hella fun at low level horror yeah, genre the, yeah post-apocalyptic noir horror is best one at low oh, genre God, yeah. because yeah. the threat level they have the low pool points the threat level of death coming at any moment you know it's it's 
it can be run at higher tier. It's just better at lower tier. Yeah, you definitely got to um, put in a lot of work to be spooky and threatening when your characters are tier six. But yeah. it's still doable, but it going to yeah. be a lot of work on you to GM. <laughs> right. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. So I think... Oh, <laughs> what are you laughing about? I'm before laughing we, at Eric. Before Eric, we... Eric, Eric is talking about his charts again. <laughs> Got it. You done this? <laughs> no, I'm just laughing at Eric. I'm just saying, talking about his charts again. Go ahead. <laughs> Before we um we log off into like our over what our overall opinion is, I'm just curious from chat. Like, do you guys have any questions of higher tier play, and do you have any glorious or horror stories with your experiences with higher tier play that you know we could talk about? It's hard for me to say anything. Uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully playing um, in a high tier one shot um, and to see what the whole experience is like. Um, I'm assuming it's going to be a lot of fun and maybe, again, depending on the GM, we might break their plans completely if they don't prepare properly. Um, I know if I'm the one GMing a tier six game, y'all will probably break it in a heartbeat. But, <laughs> yeah. Um. Jesus had a question. He said, is high tier horror something like Predator or Dog Soldiers? I would say Dog Soldiers, yes, but you can also say high tier horror would be anything related to Call of Cthulhu. High tier horror is high tier horror is those things where you as a human being are truly uh, compromised. You don't have you the only thing that's saving you are your wits and luck is is high tier horror. You know, uh, those, high, those, go ahead, Ant. I was going to say, high tier horror is Cthulhu. Yeah, you I said fail, that. Yeah, Cthulhu, you, definitely. You fail your role, you go insane. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, the consequences of horror is not threatening to your, your pools. It's threatening to your mental stability. Like, you, you go down, there's no more, I'm hitting you for eight points of damage. It's, you go down two on the damage track. Mm -hmm. You know, once you hit in tier six horror, it's more psychological horror than anything physical. Jason C said in tier yeah. six, since so many abilities require no cause, how do you make it difficult on the players? How do you get them to spend pool points? Do you just up the DC to really high level? I would say that's one thing you can do, but the other way you make them spend pool points is you put them in situations that it's not just about a typical role. It's not, you know what, you have to start introducing things that force them to use those points because they need to figure things out. Um, you put you put things out there like, you know, like we were saying earlier, in one game I used ambient damage. There was a device that was causing ambient damage, but they had to spend pool points in order to find a device to shut it off. Because other than that, they were just being you know, it was it was a slow draw, but it worked. You know, things like that. You just have to be inventive. You got to be creative in how you approach your players. Yeah, I think naturally you absolutely going to have to have higher DCs because that's just the nature of the way Cypher is, is designed. But I, I I could also say you could you could also attack pools that are the least efficient in. You know, like so. You know. If you have a bunch of warriors, then your, your NPCs are doing intellect damage, where you know they, they, they don't... You start you really start utilizing what's on their sheet against them. You know, so, you like, if, if you have a bunch of uh, adepts, then you're attacking the might pool. You know, you know what I mean? So, or, or start, like what Dean said, start having... Instead of having one bad or two bad, start having four or five bads that all do different type of abilities, so mm -hmm. they... You know, everything's not a speed defense or everything's not a might defense, you know. So it's going to require... when you, st you You're going to find that if you attack a pool that isn't their strength, inherently people are going to want to spend effort to defend against something that's taking... Which is they taking points from their weak pool to begin with because they spend the effort to defend against something that is already weak to begin with. You know exactly. what I mean? But they're protecting... You know, and I mean... Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and something that I noticed with 
quite a few GMs that I've encountered. A lot of people don't use, you know, speaker type abilities against the players. You know, start using that kind of stuff. Start using stuff that's affecting them. You know what? I've done that. I've done that in a couple of games. I've turned players against the other players in the game. You, you, hey, I'm going to use you guys high tier. Guess what? I can't. I mean, no, I, I can't fight you. But guess what? You can fight each other. You, you, so, you know what? Another cool trick is that people tend not to do. You don't have to have a super high DC, but if you have a super high armor, yep. that the, in order for them to hit them, they're going to need, you know, like if, if they do it naturally, they do in six points of damage. Have somebody show up with an armor of eight. So the only way they're going to damage them is by applying effort in damage. So they're yep. exhausting their pool just to get a hit in. You know what I mean? Like, or even, or even just have, or even have an armor, even have an armor four is going to do that because guess what? You're whittling. You're only doing two points of damage every time you hit this guy. You know, guys, with people who want to spam onslaught, guess what? You're going to spend effort to up that onslaught to do more damage because you only do four points of damage, and he's like, oh, yeah, pink. Uh, you know, so these are things that, like Anthony, like we all are saying, you just have to learn to manipulate the environment. Like I said, you got to play chess with your player characters when if you want to look at it from the game aspect and if you want to look at it from the story aspect that's where your your villains become interested your your antagonists become interested brilliant losers Cenobites are definitely high tier characters not sure they suitable for a high tier adventure though i think the the, the thing with horror is is that in in most great horror stories, especially the supernatural horror stories, the, the bad guys are just way more powerful than the mortal men. You know what I mean? That's what makes it scary, that you can't, you in an unwinnable situation. You know, right. you know what I mean? So Cenobites are high tier villains, right? But they more effective putting Cenobites versus level one and two characters than they are against level four and five characters. And, and again, well, th that's the thing. You need to think about what the story is you, you're trying to tell. What are you trying to, um, what are you trying to evoke? You know, I, I'll agree with anybody. I think uh, horror, horror, horror games, they could be, you know, I, I look at those as like doing seasons. I, I could see doing, you know, like American Horror Story. Let's do 12 episodes of a, of a horror game, okay? You might get to tier two by the end of it because now you're versed, you learned about it, you know, or, you know, that, that would be my idea of doing a horror story. If I wanted to do something a little bit more adventurous and play like Supernatural, your character would never get beyond tier three or four because even as badass as Sam and Dean were, you know what? You know when 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 the angel came in. You, you see, but Sam and, Sam and Dean, that's not horror. That's no, I'm just saying. No, I said that's adventure. Yeah, yeah, that's adventure. That's what I said. I said if yeah. you want to do something more adventurous, then it would be like that. But horror, I would never let characters be more than tier two. You you your tier two character, and that's because you become versed. If you think about it, like um, what's uh like like for example, you become a, let's say. You're like Van Helsing. You know all about vampires. You know their weaknesses and stuff. But Van Helsing still was just a man taking on Dracula. You know, that was a tier two character versus a tier five vampire. <laughs> you know, so th those are the aspects. You're absolutely right. Man. I'm, I agree with you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. I think, I think there's, a, uh, there's, a, we could do, let's do a horror video because I, <laughs> I, I definitely have opinions on, on, uh, on, um, horror, you know, like just look how, how Stay Alive is based. You know what I mean? Even in the book, the tears in Stay Alive are not as robust as they are in the Cypher System core book. Like the stuff you get in the higher tears of Stay Alive are not as robust as what you well, get in it for a reason. You know, it, what I mean? it even says that in tear in 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 the Stay Alive book, uh, Sean definitely references that that you know you may not want to run. Uh, a long campaign as far as a uh, horror game is concerned versus, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you, but you can add horror elements to something else and that would be different. So, 
Yeah, but that's another discussion. <laughs> but anyway, Cenobites are a high tier, and you could probably run it at high tier. But um, they but they definitely I wouldn't personally do it. So, what is your overall opinion on the Cipher System character? I forgot one. System? You forgot you forgot a question. Which one? How would we handle characters advanced past tier six? Oh, oh, that's a great question. This is a question that actually I put this in there because a lot of people talk about this. I mean, I well, feel like this might even be like a question that's good enough for a whole video on itself because there's so many different ways. I mean, again, I've never done it, but yeah. there's lots of ways you can handle it. Like, again, you just add the advancement track and they just keep continuing up the levels. And again, you as a GM will just have to, you know, make the numbers harder or bigger or whatever have you. But you can also like, um, what you call it? I, I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> Well, my idea with handling characters past tier six is this. What the way I see it is that you don't necessarily you you'll never hit tier seven. There will never be, you know, uh you know, tier seven, eight, nine, but you will be able to attain some new abilities. But those abilities will cost more. You know. I mean or we could advance the, the tier seven. But it still is going to cost you more. It's not going to be four, four, four anymore. It might be, you know, it might cost you, you know, twelve points to to get that next ability because you're so far beyond, you know. <laughs> it, I mean, it, you, you could easily do six, 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 six. Yeah, that too. You know, or five, 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 five. It, it all depends. depends on, yeah, it all depends on where your story's going, right? And and then you know, like. Because your fo just because your focus doesn't have another ability past six, right? You could always pick a pick a, a tier six ability from a, another focus, or pick another focus entirely and start from scratch again. Right. You know, right. like like look, once again, you drives like a maniac, but you now who drives like a maniac who's licensed to carry. <laughs> so now you start from. You know, you start, your focus starts from, you have all the tier six, now you're moving into another focus and you're picking up all those abilities. Exactly. I actually really and, like that idea. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, it, it's a great idea, but again, you know, it's kind of like it was when I when I used to play D&D. &D. I come from an era in D&D &D when there were no level caps. Everything did not end at 20th level, hmm. okay? And we played, and I ended up with a character that was like a 43rd level thief and a 27th level fighter. It was something stupid. And by then, it was just like it was it was it was it, was, it wasn't as fun because we were we were just killing everything. You know, that's an epic level play. Um, unless you have a really solid idea for an epic level story, retire those characters. Let those characters become the legends in the world. And start a, the new the next story out, you know. That's what I like to do. A lot of times, I'll get players up. If players ever get max out, you know, when they finish that final storyline, they become legendary heroes. You know, I let them set up uh, iconic places in the world. You know, that character becomes an NPC. They get to role play that character when we play the next story arc. If something's going on, they can play their character as. You know, he's the he's he's the gunsmith. He gives everybody their guns or, you know, he's the merchant who sells all of this, you know, whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. You know, but those are the ways that I kind of handle that, because after a certain point, that just not, it's not fun to play to me. I mean, but yeah, but some, some people do. And we want yeah, to I know. give them an option of how, how they could handle that. You know what I mean? See, this is what I mean. Like, this could be a whole video in and of itself. Like, there's so yeah. many, like, interesting ways you could take characters beyond that six-tier threshold, whether they want to retire them, become legends of, you know, the universe, or, you know, pick up new traits, or go to seventh tier. Like, again, it's... Let's and that, talk about... Let's, so let's set that up as another video. Yeah, it's 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 just a, a testament to Cypher System that even though it limits you to sixth tier... Mm -hmm. Like, just the stuff in the book, like, gives you the tools needed to go past it, should you want to. Um, right. And I believe Sean said, if I could be mistaken, but when we interviewed Sean for Clean the Sky, he said there will be some discussion in the book about advancing past tier six. 
he did. He said that there would definitely be more stuff. You know, and with superheroes, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you <Definitely>. know. <laughs> um, so, last question, guys. What is your overall opinion on Cypher System's character advancement? I like it. <laughs> Period. <laughs> no, no, but but seriously, it's it's awesome. Um, it, it has a very we we said this in the beginning. Uh, I think it has a very natural feeling to it. Like it, it it's tied to the narrative. Again, if you're not really a narrative mindset player, it's really straightforward to follow as far as your crunch or whatever goes. And again, even from a crunch or a narrative perspective, it all feels very natural. Like your character is becoming more hardy. They're learning new things. Um, what you call it? Um, it, it, it's, it feels very smooth for lack of a better word. Like it all connects very well. And the, the progression just again, feels natural. It's, it's nice. Uh, um, I like it. No. <laughs> uh, I think I think that um, character progression is unique, and it's one of the things that drove me to the cyber system. You know, the whole concept of you know the sentence, and each part of the sentence, you know, gives you decisions and options as you're building your character. You know, I love that concept. I, you know, I love that every time you tear up. That there's decisions to be made, especially now with, with your focus giving you decisions on multiple abilities, you know, on more than one level, more than one tier. I really love that. But I will say this, that Cypher system, it's very possible to make the wrong decision in character advancement if you're not, like, careful, if, you know, what you're doing. But, you know, there's not, when you don't get flat abilities given to you and they give you options, you could, you could always, it always lends itself to picking something that you might regret later, right? The beauty about Cypher system is that you can always auto-correct it, but that option is still there. So, you know, I, you know, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention that, but I, it's one of the things that drove me to love the Cypher system in the first place. You know, I love the way you could have two characters with the same almost identical sentences and be totally different because of the options you have when picking your character. Hell, you could have characters who have literally the same exact sentence and they're still wildly different based on how they like distributed their points, what abilities they chose, what flavors they might have went with. They could be entirely different. It's amazing. And for me, what I'm going to say about it is this, as my Echo and my two buddies here, I like it. Matter of <laughs> fact, I kinda, I'm kind of in love with it. For the simple fact, what it did was, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but I know Anthony, you probably are, but like uh, older games like uh, Cypher, uh, Cyberpunk and Mechton and a few other games, they had the life path charts. And the life path charts were awesome. The problem, the only problem with the life path charts were they were just flavor. Whereas with Cypher System, it's built right into the system. Those life path ideologies and, and, and so on and so forth, when you build your sentence, when you start looking at the abilities you're choosing and so on and so forth, those are like built in life path ideas. The fact that they will tie in uh, character backgrounds to each other, you know, character connections, and those connections actually can be pertinent. They can be. They can have character um, mechanical ideologies going on because you know what, your abilities don't work on this character over here, or this character causes this ability to trigger, or trigger, and so on and so forth. All of those aspects, those were something that I always loved because, you know, I was a person who wanted the interactive storytelling a long time before the narrative game was a thing. I, like I said, I come from the era when it was GM versus player. You know, and you had to you had to shape your group. You know, you had to find the right people to play with so you could shape the group to tell your stories if that's what you were into. Um, and then you house ruled everything. So for me, Cypher System is was, was one of those games that is the game, I should say, in the character creation process 
that I don't feel like I have to house rule. You know, even if I do add something to it, I don't even feel like it's a house rule. And guess what? This is just an option because it works the same way. Like when we added player intrusions, it was just it was it was already something in the game. We just flipped over some a, a piece of it, flipped over a coin. And so those things. Uh, is, I think what Cypher system, what makes it unique and what makes it our go-to place, you know, that that's what's special about it for me. So final thoughts. I mean, I, I think that's it. I, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> my, my final thought is take the narrative into account when you advance in your tiers. I think most people don't, you know, and I, I think, you're gonna you're gonna have a more enjoyable overall progression of your character if you could see the story impacting the way you design your character from tier to tier. And since Cypher System allows you to design it, you know, to tier up in steps, you know, it's a lot easier to do because you you remember it's a lot easier for you to remember what happened in the last session and it'll dictate your actions. Narrative, narrative, narrative. Like if uh, Infinite Construct said, take it into account in character creation. I promise you, you will enjoy the experience. And I'm going to say this about it, about character creation. My final thought on it is, yes, narrative, narrative, narrative. Yes, take into account all of those aspects. But remember, you also have other little tools to come along with it. Like in the process of playing the game, you have short-term and long-term benefits that you can take advantage of which can become a part of your character. These concepts, these things that, you know, other other systems don't add into, don't, they're not pluggable. You know, it's not, it's not that plug you have. So character arcs, you know, that's another piece of the piece of the pie that you add into with the advancement, with the tier system, because you can do all of those aspects, you know, you know, when they start making those, 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 uh, pragmatic spots on the character arc and so on and so forth. Combine it all, remember it all, and have fun with it all. Cypher system. So with that, we've got everybody's final statements. If you like Cypher system, you like um, you like Cypher Unlimited, you like what we do, please give us a like, share, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Or visit our Cypher Unlimited Discord server. We're close to 4,000 members. We're the largest fan run Discord server out there. We have games being run pretty much daily. You can come chat. And if you want, I'm serious about that March 18th thing. Hit me up on the Discord server, and we'll definitely get a Tier 6 game going on that day. Like I said, it's my birthday. I love to have a game going on that day. So if, you, if you're interested, just hit me up. Um, also, visit our online store. Get some cool Cypher Unlimited merch, like the hat I'm wearing or the shirt Dean has on. We don't have this bazooka shirt, but it's still cool as hell. Right? Oh, visit our Kofi. You know, give us a little, a little donation there. Like I said, our videos will always be free, but you know, um, it helps us out with little things like Zoom calls. Go to our Facebook page. You know, follow us there. There's chats being um, discussed, or all sorts of cipher system discussions happening there on our Facebook page. Um, give us a, a, a follow or sub here on, on Twitch. You know, we we love to chat with you guys. We love to BS with everyone, and you know, most of all, we love you guys. What's so funny, Al? No, just I, as soon as I posted the Facebook message, the bot posted it again because it was on the timer for it. So I'm like. Did, did I miss anything? No, I, think I, 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 I think you got everything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you guys so much for stopping by. It's been a blast as usual. Um, Don't forget to raid. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you guys next week. Um, from us at the CU, we will see you later.